what is distance exactly? You might think just take two different points and measure it, right? That's the distance. But in this video, we're gonna see that there are all kinds of different types of distance. And what we're really gonna do is unify all the different types of distances into one concept, the concept of a metric. My thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. More about them at the end of the video. The first alternate type of distance I want to consider is inspired by the streets of Manhattan. Indeed, it's sometimes called the Manhattan distance or the taxicab metric. And the idea here is that because the roads in Manhattan are on such a nice grid system, that a taxi is really only able to go left or right, up or down, but not diagonally. They can't fly in a straight line diagonally. And so distance in this context is sort of a sum of the amount that you have to go horizontally plus the amount that you have to go vertically. Another strange distance, sometimes called the Chebyshev distance, comes up in the game of chess. In chess, the king is a powerful piece because it can move to the right, it can move to the left, it can move up, it can move down, but it can also move diagonally. And unlike with Euclidean or straight line distance where a move one to the right and one up would have a distance of root two, in chess, a move diagonally is still considered just a distance of one. This is particularly relevant in this king and pawn endgame where black gets to move and they're trying to advance their pawn to the end to become a queen. But the distance for the pawn is three squares and the distance for the king that can move diagonally is also three squares. And as a result, the pawn is going to get to the end and become a queen, but not fast enough. Our white queen captures it and preserves a draw. Now what I'd like to do is actually come up with some formulas for these different types of distances. Let's take the normal Euclidean straight line distance first. I'm gonna have two points A and B and I wanna figure out that distance between them. Now, to come up with a formula, I'm going to label the coordinates of A as having X1 and Y1 coordinates and the coordinates for B an X2 and a Y2. So what this gives us is a triangle. So we're trying to figure out what is the, well, hypotenuse of that triangle. Uh, links to the merge, by the way, down in the description. So the formula then is just gonna be that the distance between A and B, so this is a formula that, that takes an A and a B and figures out the distance, just given by the square root of the sum of the squares, the square root of the x2 minus the x1 squared plus the y2 minus the y1 squared. So that's the straight line distance, but what if instead we went to that taxi cab distance? I can have the A and the B as before, I've put on the grid lines just to indicate I can only move either horizontally or vertically. So to get from the A to the B, we have this sort of interesting path. So what's that distance? Well, basically you're just going along the X's first, going along the Y's next. So this distance is just gonna be the sum of those two things. Specifically, we use absolute values because they could be positive or negative and we want distance to always be thought of as a positive thing. So either way, it's the absolute value of the x distance plus the absolute value of the y distance. That is the distance formula in the so-called taxicab metric. Okay, let's do one more. Let's do the Chebyshev distance. So this is again, I've got an A and a B here. And for this distance, you can move x and y at the same time. So what's sort of relevant here is that there is a larger distance to go in x than there was in y. So what's the distance formula? It is the maximum of the x distance and the y distance. Depending on what your a and the b is, one is gonna be larger than the other, but in this way of moving, we're thinking of diagonals as just as much effort as going purely horizontally or purely vertically, and so it's just the maximum, whichever the most amount of travel that you're gonna to have to do. So for all three of these formulas, basically what we're doing is we're inputting two points in a and a b, and we're coming up with some formula that gives the distance. But should I really think of these other formulas beyond the straight line as a distance? Is it appropriate to give the name distance to them? What do I mean by distance in a more general concept than just the straight line distance? So what I'm gonna to introduce to you next is the notion of a metric. So the idea is this. Imagine I have some set S. In this case, we've been using the set has been the two-dimensional real plane each time, but it could just be any set that you like. Then what I'm gonna come up with is a distance function D, and the distance function works like this. It takes two things from the set, an A and a B, so it starts in what we call S cross S, to use our fancy notation, and it spits out 
a positive real number. So for example, the distance between two points is going to be just some positive number, like say three. Okay, but the distance formula can't just be anything, can't be any function. It has to obey three common properties to be termed a, an appropriate notion of, of distance, or our fancy word here is metric. So the first property is that if you have two points and the distance between them is zero, then those two points are actually the same point. In other words, the distance between A and B is equal to zero, and it has to go both directions if and only if A is equal to B. The second property is called symmetry, and it says that it doesn't matter which you put first, the A or the B. The distance from A to B is the same thing as the distance from B to A. We can see that in all of our metrics. It doesn't matter which you put first, the distance between them is always going to be the same. And then the third property is an incredibly important one, and it's called the triangle inequality. It works like this. It says, if you take the distance from A to C, then this is always going to be smaller than going from A up to some intermediate B, and then that intermediate B up to C. We can sort of visually see this property for all three of them. For the straight line metric, it kind of forms this triangle. If you have this A, B, and C, then you can see that the hypotenuse from A to C is always going to be shorter than going from A out to some other point B all the way up to C. If B happens to be on the line, then there would be an equality, but our triangle inequality is less than or equal to, so that's allowed. In the taxicab metric, again, a very similar idea. It might be equal, but by going to some other point, you just have the possibility that you've added more distance by breaking it up this way. And we can illustrate the idea of the triangle inequality in the Chebyshev distance as well. Imagine that the king is trying to get to this square. Well, if that's what's going to happen directly, it's just two different moves away. However, if you propose that it needs to go through, say, an intermediate square like this one, then now it's going to be three moves away, first going from A to B, and then B over to C, a total of three moves. Now, at the end of the video, I want to talk a little bit about why we might want to introduce this more general concept of a metric. But for now, I want to play around with each of the three metrics that we've seen and talk about what are all of the points of distance one from any given starting spot. So for example, in this normal straight line or Euclidean distance, it's just a circle. All of the points of distance one from a spot, this creates this circle. This is sometimes called the open ball of radius one if I don't include that boundary. And open balls like these are actually incredibly important in the field of mathematical analysis. So I want to look and see what is the open ball for all of the different distances. For example, if I go to taxi cab distance, well, in this distance, I could go one up, say, or alternatively, if I am allowed to move only one, I could go one to the right. And I could also sort of split the difference, like I could go to a point like this one here that's like half a step to the right and half a step up. And by extending that idea, the points that are of distance one from where I begin, the yellow point, anything along this dotted line is actually going to work. Some, some proportion to the right and some proportion up. So the open ball of radius one actually looks like a diamond. This is what all of the points of distance one from that starting spot are in the taxicab metric. Finally, in the Chebyshev metric, okay, what do we have here? Well, this one, I mean, I can go up just as I did before, uh, a distance of one. I can go to the right, a distance of one as well. But I can also go off diagonally. And as you will recall with the Chebyshev distance, it's just the maximum of the horizontal or the vertical. So I could, for example, in distance one, in this notion of distance, go all the way out to the corner. You might have a moment of pause here because you say, well, hold on, in Euclidean distance, that diagonal one has a distance of root two. But the point is, this is a different measure of distance. Under this measure of distance, that's a distance of one. And so, in fact, the unit ball of radius one is, well, all of these points, this entire square. So we've seen a circle, a diamond, and a square for sort of three different open balls of radius one around a point, depending on which metric we're in. Now, you might ask, why are we even bothering with the formalism of defining this notion of a metric? As in, in any given context, why don't we just deal with the distance formula that's relevant for that context? Why do we even need to mathematically have this more general notion of a metric? Well, one of the things that mathematicians do is they like to build up a larger theory on top of basic ideas. 
And indeed, if you start with the idea of a metric, you can begin defining new concepts like, say, continuity of a function, and building up theorem after theorem after theorem all on top of the general idea of a metric. And the big advantage of this is, if you've proven all of these theorems that stem from the idea of a metric, then you don't have to prove them every time you've got some specific metric, some specific notion of distance that's relevant to you. You can just use all of those theorems. And indeed, mathematical analysts have built up this entire edifice of theorems and new concepts on top of the idea of a metric. And we can employ all of this just by proving that whatever notion of a distance you have happens to be a metric. If it satisfies those axioms, then you can use this larger theory. As a math professor, I know that the best way to really master mathematics is to actually get your hands dirty playing around with the math. That is why I am so proud to be sponsored by Brilliant. Check out this neural net, for example. We've got two different layers of 50 neurons. And then if I come here and use my mouse to sketch some digit, I'm gonna sketch an eight here. Let's see if it can figure it out. Indeed, the neural net has predicted that what I have sketched is an eight. Pretty cool, right? Well, that example was part of Brilliant's entire course that they have on neural networks, one of their many different courses. And I didn't know anything about neural networks, and so I thought it'd be really fun to dig in and try to learn something. And as you can see, they've broken it up into an enormous number of different little lessons, and each of these lessons is fantastic. What I love about their lessons is there's so many opportunities for you to actually play around and practice. A neural network is complicated, but you can sort of get some intuition to it by trying to flip on and off the different switches. And as you play around, you can get some intuition for exactly how a multi-layered neural network is gonna work. And then the best thing is, you get to actually go and test yourself here. So I'm gonna try and submit the left neuron, and that was correct. If I had screwed it up, then I could click the show explanation, and they're gonna tell me exactly why it is that it's supposed to be the left neuron. This is all extremely effective pedagogy, and it's just fun to learn. So go to brilliant.org slash Trevor Bazzett and sign up for free, and in addition, the first 200 people to use the link down in the description are gonna get an additional 20% off an annual premium subscription. With that said, if you have any questions about this video, leave them down in the comments below, and we'll do some more math in the next video.